You're listening to Adventure Party for the 2nd of September 2021. This week, maybe your RPG doesn't have a thief class or a pickpocket skill, but you can still steal some mechanics for it. The Adventure Party, discussing tabletop made gaming the Irish way. Welcome to the party. I'm Warlord Scar. I'm Savage Mick. And today we have a guest with us. Uh, say hello, Dave. Hello, I am Dave. Dave has come on because he's uh, been uh, trapped in a dungeon called Galway for the last uh, five years and he desperately needs to, us to know and also he'd like to talk to us about uh, our topic today. So... That wasn't an intro. What the hell? No, hold on a second. <coughs> Excuse me, Warlord. Uh, may I... Oh, okay. You could defy me if you want. And, you know, I have my great smoke right here. It's fine. <laughs> That's right. I've got half a mug of coffee. I'll be fine. Dave, otherwise known to Denzians of our Discord, which you can definitely come and join. A uh, bit of a trickle around the flood lately, so we'd love to see you. If you're listening, we'd love to see you down there. But Dave is also known on the Discord as... Decimus Observate. I wasn't sure how to pronounce that. I want to just call you Decky. I have an uncle called Decky. That's Decky. fine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, David is, for the purposes of recording, but for the purposes of infamy, uh, all you out there listening who are finding your way to the Discord, that's Decimus's Discord server clout elevated. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> uh, what, what are we here to talk about? It is. Uh, theft. It's, uh, like stealing the limelight, you mean? The show. No, like, you know, once you've slain your, your foes, you have to clearly loot their corpses and take everything of value. That's, that's, oh, how, yeah. that's how armies work, right? Specifically, we're here to talk about things that you should steal. Things that you are morally obligated to steal to, uh, to improve your RPG. Uh, yeah, do you want to start off, Dave? Or uh, will, I, will I be the trailblazer here? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy enough to start. Uh, yeah, I, su- I suppose um, I've been reading a fair few different RPG systems, and um, yeah, no, I've been having notions about about mechanics. Like, I, I suppose if you want, like, um, say a fantasy game, D and D, if you want to make it a bit more of a sword and sorcery vibe, you can loot mechanics from. I suppose one of those D twenty games which do lean more sword and sorcery. Stuff like uh, magic being a bit more perilous, like uh, the possibility of a spell not working or misfiring in some spectacular and uh, hilarious manner. And uh, that will, like even a small tweak like that, will change the tone of a game very quickly. Do you have any particular examples that uh, you've seen in the past? Uh, Sure. Um, Low fantasy gaming uh, is... it, it. it's derived from fi- from 5e, but a lot of OSR sensibilities draws a lot in sword and sorcery. Uh, magic is dangerous. Uh, it's got perilous magic. M- magic can critically fail, uh, which is not a thing I imagine most D&D players are used to. It's um, a much lower magic world in general, like its default setting. And yeah, the magic feels... It like it's still good. It's still useful to have, but you can't just throw around like confetti to solve your problems. Or you can, but it's not a good idea. That's that's one one. I could go with a big topic, or I go with a small one uh, for my suggestion. Or, no, let's have Mick go first. For uh, things to steal from games, uh, there's okay. There's one that I've talked about on the Discord. Join our <laughs> Discord. Um, a couple of times, and it's the. Oh, let me see if I can dig up the exact mechanic. It's from. It's from a game called I think it's called Hardcore D and D by a chap called Hanker and for Hanker and Fernail or something along those lines. Uh, let me. Th- it's a, it's about a candle. So there's this great. Oh yeah. Mechanic. It's a great save mechanic that he's basically nicked from. I'm searching the Discord. Discord is search functions, by the way. Hashtag Discord. Uh, if I just type in hardcore, what's going to come back? Zimmer's Candle. Here we go. So Zimmer's Candle appears in 5e Hardcore. And it's this great mechanic where you're given this magic candle. This is, one I, this is a, an example of something being stolen from video games, implemented, I think, really well in tabletop. 
and something you should definitely consider stealing for a whole bunch of reasons. But one of the main ones is it's cool. And Zimmer's Candle basically is a candle that your players can light. It's a magical power of artifact. It's like a black candle, maybe a few inches long. And don't think a big thick candle. Something that's going to burn down in like an hour. When they light it, it basically creates a save point for the party. A, a moment in time they can return to if they're all killed. But it's an actual candle that has to exist in the actual world they're in. So if you want to use it, you've got to figure out where to put it, how to keep it lit, how to keep it safe. And at least one hero must be able to call upon the candle to activate it. So it, it gives players a chance to drop a, a post and say, right, if this next fight goes really badly, we can return to this moment and try again. Even if we're dead. Like, it's, it's powerful, powerful stuff. It is, and I'm sure good players will figure out ways to abuse it. But, you know, you can limit the number they get. You can kind of, you can make other, uh, you can attach other stipulations. But I really like the idea of a save mode in, in tabletop RPGs because it gives players permission to try outlandish things and it gives you permission to throw outlandish things at them and see if they can make it through. So, yeah, Zimmer's Campbell uh, 5e Hardcore is definitely one that I would consider stealing. Now, it changes a lot about the game and death mechanics and risk-reward, etc. But, yeah, I think there's, there's, it's, a, it's so powerful, it's, it's so unique that it, it, it helps change the way you play your game sometimes. Not a bad thing. Okay, that's me for now. I've got to go dig up another mechanic. Okay, well, I was going to go to a big indie game that uh, has been very influential in the last uh, few years, Blades in the Dark, and its spin-offs, such as Scum and Villainy, A Band of Blades, and there's a whole bunch of other. Uh, Forge in the Dark is a sort of institution now, uh, but not everyone knows about it, and there's a lot of elements that I think people should look into when they're considering their own game. Just if they wanted to have a bit more of that skullduggery. A bit of that, not quite the sword and sorcery that Dave was talking about, but uh, definitely the bit of a grittier feel to a game. Blades basically sets itself up so that it's very gritty and dangerous and all that, but also it really helps push players to risk things, because the riskier something is, the more likely you are to get something spectacular out of it. So it really pushes out that risk-reward element. And it does it with a couple of different mechanics. One of the ones that I think is most important is uh, their stress mechanics. You basically have a pool of stress points that you spend to get extra, di- extra dice in your roll or uh, similar effects. Actually, it's not you have stress points, you have a stress gauge. Sorry, And if your stress gauge fills up, you start taking permanent penalties. I forget, is it a derangement or... It's been a while since I looked this up. Sorry. I was too busy making lists to actually uh, double-check some of the stuff. But yeah, it's just like, if you let your stress build up to a high enough point, and stress is very important for, you know, the not dying that you have to do when you, you know, fall out of a building you're burgling or get stabbed by 50 guards. That will make you kind of question your life choices, yes? Yeah. But yeah, if, if your stress fills up, bad things happen. Uh, so you have to balance your stress by indulging in vices. You, you have to say, my, my character drinks, my character likes the funny weeds. <laughs> my character likes living it up as a pretend uh, bourgeoisie. You know, something about your character that you, you, ha- you can indulge. And spend the, all that money that you got in the job you just did. Spend that money indulging in your vice. And that does so many different things. It makes sure that you're not just this superhero who never has to go to the bathroom. Never feels the need to, you know, to have a house and, you know, I'll, I'll sleep in a ditch. It's fine. My character's got 18 con. Burning stress is really useful to you because it lets you succeed in things where normally you'd fail. But it comes with a downside that if you let it fill up. Bad things happen, so you have to live like a edge of society thief would live, indulging your vices, spending all that coin you 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 got uh, in you know making yourself feel better, and then having 
having to deal with the consequences of, oh, I overindulged my vice. I may have stabbed someone. Oh, dear. Sorry, Shade. How, um, how tricky would that be to move over to another game? Like, how tied in into the, the rest of the mechanics is it? It's sort of based on dice pools. Uh, Blades of Dark has, like, a couple of D6s in dice pool. And, like, it's a kind of setup where, like, four dice and something is actually really good. So the difference in just spending one stress or one dice is important. If you're reporting it up to something like D&D, I would have it be essentially a pool of advantage. Uh, so, like, you, you get extra d20 on your roll. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so you can you can dole them out, or you can build a track for players to keep, keep a tally of, of how much stress they've accumulated. And then, obviously, they have to pay it off in different ways. It introduces an aspect to the game that isn't sort of there in the rules, but it can layer in. Uh, I suppose the closest thing in D&D is kind of exhaustion, which accumulates and then is dissipated very slowly. Uh, I actually, yeah, it's something I've been looking for. I like the exhaustion rules in D and D fifth ed, but they're a little too harsh. Whereas the stress vice mechanic kind of works in in a similar way, but isn't quite as penalizing on the table. In fact, it kind of works the reverse. You gain the advantage at the moment you take the stress, and later on you've got to to peel it off. Whereas yeah. with exhaustion, you gain a disadvantage at the moment you gain the exhaustion. Uh, I'd also like to point out Blades of the Dark, great system. Going for a walk and talking to your mum are not included as options for dealing with your stress, which uh, tells you everything you need to know about that game. Yeah, like obviously you want to have your list of things that can reduce stress and tune those to uh, be appropriate yeah. for your campaign. So it could be feasting, it could be uh, it could be composing a new ballad about your adventures or something. Yeah, if you're in a more chivalrous campaign setting, that kind of thing, yeah. Or you could tailor it to the various classes, so they'll all have different ways of blowing off stress. Yeah, I, mm. I, could, I yeah. could absolutely see a barbarian blowing off stress a bit differently than a wizard. <laughs> like wrestling an Orox or something, you know, his pet Orox from when he was a kid. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Things stands 15 feet at the shoulder now, but hey, <laughs> it's, it's still friendly. Still lucky. <laughs> Uh, there's a few other things from Blades I wanted to go over quickly. One is, uh, as well as you know, getting extra dice in a roll, stress has a mechanic called flashbacks, where you can spend a stress to basically you do a quick side scene where you explain how your character set up so- some solution to a problem you just faced. If you've seen Ocean's Eleven, it's very inspired by that kind of, oh, we just met a problem, but actually I thought of this beforehand. Uh, and you can basically spend stress to retroactively have like something in your pocket or have bribed one of those guards or something like that. And that's a very uh, interesting mechanic. You still have to roll for it, depending on the, the, the premise of your flashback. But it's, it's, a very, it's an interesting way to encourage stress thing. Cause, and it also reduces prep time because, okay, this is obviously going to be an option because some groups really love the nitty gritty we spend two sessions planning the 30 minute heist maneuver that we're doing. Uh, you know, we, we do all our prep, we do all the role playing and, uh, we do our pull off our heist like that. Some groups love that. Some can't stand it. They want to get straight to the action. Blades of the Dark says, let's get straight to the action. Let's just start with a roll to see what happens at the very first obstacle. Uh, and then, if you want to have planned or prepared for something inside this complex or bank or cave or whatever, we just spend the stress, get a flashback, and you say, let's see how well you did it preparing for this. And that's that's sort of the idea of that, uh, of that mechanic, is just they want to move all of the prep work, which is either amazing or tedious, depending on your taste. This is a way to move that uh, into the, the in the middle of play, we decide how well we prepare for this. I, well, I'm think well, the thought that comes to mind is that would work brilliantly for something like a Mistborn campaign. You know, with, which let's face it involves a lot of heists and criminal, criminal ill related uh, daring do. Mm, mm. Yeah, I totally had this iron to magnetize the loot and pull the bars off the wall, walls. You know, does the Brandon Sanderson books? 
Yeah. Do, do they have a, a? Has any written an RPG for that yet? Um. Yeah. No. Uh, crafty games have a rather good RPG for it. I know at least one evangelist for it. So yeah, it's it's something to check out if you're a fan of those books, or Mr. Sanderson's you know entire library. It's very good stuff. Let's just. I just want to quickly touch on two other things from Blades in the Dark. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. Much like interleaving planning and action, we're now interleaving hosts. Let's go back to uh, Dave. Okay. Um, looting mechanics. Um, wh- one thing I, I do quite like about um, OSR, which I'm a fairly recent um, discoverer of, uh, is their it you know looting mechanics from you know across from wherever you can find them is you know a flat out encouraged so one one of my one of my finds was neoclassical geek revival and it has lots of interest <laughs> right yeah it's an odd title oh, but no. um this this is like when shoegaze came along and i didn't understand music anymore it's like well, okay what's this genre <laughs> So um, yeah, it's a it's a D twenty OSR game, but it's got neat little things like when you're making your character, you you've got p- five pie slices, and if you you know, and you co- you combine them to make a character, and you could take pie slices from say fighter, and you if you take all fighter pie slices, you have a fighter like it works like you know just like a fighter. But you can mix and match. You could put in something, you know, something um, more roguelike if you want a bit of stealth. You could um, assign all your pie slices away from classes and basically be a lucky so and so who's who's made who's made their way through life without any real skill. That would probably take a bit more um, mecha- you know, fiddling about to get it to work with another system. But it offers interesting possibilities. And it also has neat uh, social combat system. There's um, like right after the section on um, you know fighting from the high ground for physical combat. There's the moral high ground for social combat, where you, you're you're trying to set up y- you know, yourself so that you can you know have an advantage when you're making speeches about why you know your the villain is um, is in fact a villain and you sh- really shouldn't be listening to them you should be listening to the you know heroic speaker but that's a, that would work really good in any game set in feudal japan as well where maybe it's the moral high ground or it's the social high ground is much more important than what's actually true we i think we had an episode recently or one that is um, maybe it's recently i don't know how time works in the show where uh, it was described how an investigation couldn't go ahead until someone of high enough rank had been sort of led to a piece of evidence so that they could attest that it had been found because uh, because they were uh, important enough to be believed. I'm trying to think of things that are broadly applicable. There's a game I always look to when it comes to stealing things because it, uh, it covers so many different uh, aspects of role-playing. That's Aces and Eights, Shattered Frontier. That's a great, it's a Wild West, uh, a pretty hard-edged Wild West role-playing game, but it includes brilliant mechanics for things like jury trials. Oh. To, you, you use dice and a kind of a, a table to present how much the jury are kind of leaning towards your arguments or not. So it has lots of mechanics for these things. And you can sort of, you can sway a, a jury trial back and forth. It has a lovely kind of uh, deck of cards track for doing chase sequences. So you'll have a table that uh, shows you all the different kinds of things that could be between you and your quarry, or you and your pursuers, and then you lay out the cards to see what you have to deal with, and it calls upon various aspects of your character. You know, are they are they fleet of foot? Are they strong enough to stay on the horse as you are, are the basilisk or whatever you're riding? Can you ride basilisks? Well, let's, let's take a look at basilisk uh, anatomy in a second. Point being, it wouldn't be hard to adapt some of these. I don't know how available the game is. Uh, I've got a very old uh, deluxe copy that was printed in 1874. No, that's not right. It's just when it looks like it's printed. 2008. But Ace of Nates uh, has a bunch of good mechanics. Uh, and, and quite bizarre shooting mechanics that involve radial dials and overlays and silhouettes. So I wouldn't recommend them exactly. Uh, shotguns be be king in that, uh, but yeah, definitely there's there's a jury there's jury uh, trial mechanics there, and chase mechanics that really handy for almost any kind of game, 
and having a nice structure to use that your players can understand and that kind of works on laying cards out in a track so you can move your miniatures along it or you can keep a rel- an idea of what your relative positions are to each other without having to take up acres of table space or have tons of terrain to hand. That sounds very handy. Yeah, yeah. Two good ones there. Scar, back to you. Well, I may- maybe I will take a break from Blades in the Dark for a moment and talk about something, other things. One that comes to my mind is a game, 13th Age, uh, sort of a bit of a do-over of 4th edition uh, written by some of its writers uh, under the Palgrain Pass banner. Do see our previous interview with uh, uh, Kat Tobin? Yeah, and I've always, I've been very interested in 13th Age and its, abil- uh, its way to turn what was everyone decried as this, you know, narrativeless mechanical board game of, of an edition into one of the most interesting fancy narrative based games uh out there but yeah there's a couple of mechanics uh that i uh i i find interesting and uh one of the main ones is of course icons this is the concept that every hero if you have a, le- a level in a class you're clearly a hero and that means you are important to the big players in this setting 30th age comes with 13 icons who define this era of, of the, the universe and you know at least one of them and you have a relationship with them. It might be a bad relationship, it might be a good relationship and you have like three points to essentially move between positive and negative relationships with these icons. At the start of every session you roll your relationship die and any that come up like I think it's a five or six that icon is going to something on their organization, one of their agents, one of their magic spells or curses is going to come up in this session and uh, it's it's going to impact uh, play in one way or the other. So it's, it's, it's this idea that, no, you're not just a random yahoo wandering around stabbing goblins. You are connected to this world Maybe it's second hand. Maybe you just stab the wrong guy. You don't realize you're being tracked. But the icons are going to show up. They're going to make your life more interesting. And uh, that's just a, a, a full part of play. It's very possible that, you know, one player might have a positive relationship with the elf queen. And another person might have a negative relationship with the elf queen. So when the elf queen's wizard agents show up, both those characters all of a sudden have have something to do. So that's uh, an element I think is really cool. Can I just jump in there on that one for a second, uh, Scar? Yeah, it's, it is probably the thing I admire most about 13 Age is the icon. Now, it's, ver- it's very much a, I suppose, it's a kind of a GM campaign creation tool uh, or mechanic, but worth stealing, worth considering. Because if you've been creating campaigns for any length of time uh, and you're sort of self-aware you probably notice that you tend to return to the same themes or the same kinds of NPCs, things like that. So why not make that a virtue and build your own set of icons that you kind of drop in? And they can be, it can be sort of as abstract as the major incarna, like the trickster, the empress, the, the prophet, or it can be quite specific. You know, I always put Baron Samdi in my campaign somewhere, but what relationship Baron Samdi is going to have to the other icons. It'd be different. A bit like Sid always appears in Final Fantasy games. Yeah. So definitely worth considering, even if you don't take the whole icon package, as a GM, as someone who's creating games, you should definitely try to consider the main players and the kind of stories you want to tell. Because I think if you, by sort of solidifying a little bit, you actually free up some space to make new and creative interactions rather than your players noticing that this is the fourth time that they have been in league to uh, a king betrayed by his queen. Isn't the GM's divorce going well? <laughs> so that's it's kind of... I, it, instead, you sort of you'd kind of move it around, the jester, the, the Lancelot, the king, the queen, and you'd find new ways to, to have them interact. Betrayal might still be a, an overall theme of your campaign, but now it's the, the jester has betrayed the, the Lancelot somehow. It gets complicated, it gets weird. Write it out. Put put those put those notes in your diary. Yeah, I I, just, I think the icons one is an absolutely great one and is widely applicable. Which is you know the mechanics you steal have to be 
something you can turn into pure gaming gold down at the gaming pawn shop as quickly as this yeah this is falling apart now okay what's the next one yeah no no it's a very good point it's one of the things about icons is like at the end of the day it's a couple of d6s on your character sheet so it's like i have three d6 positive relation to the Elf queen and one d6 negative relationship with the orc king so you just roll those di- different color dice and you're way to go so it's very portable in that sense yeah light on um like gm and player um bandwidth yeah exactly uh, will I continue or will you just go back to Dave because we're we're running a long time, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Dave. You got any more for us? I'm putting you on the spot here, <laughs> a little bit. The guest spot, the hot spot. Yeah. So the uh, fifth ed, uh, the ubiquity of fifth ed does mean that there are a lot of, well, a lot of third party supplements, and that means there's an awful lot of material which. You know, should be, in theory at least, rough, you know, compatible with each other without much much tweaking at all. So uh, different writers have different ideas of what Fifth Ed could expand upon or is missing. Like, again, personal preferences and all that. And you can, you can find a 5e sup, uh, supplement or setting that emphasizes more of what you want to see. Like Adventures in Middle Earth has a whole pile of of extra rules about, say, things like travel, about um, sh- shadow corruption, and all sorts of fun stuff that could you know you know it could be used as inspiration for a different take on um, more more standard f- Fifth Ed games. Interesting. I know there's sort of a a reflexive response by a lot of deep gamers. I'll call them. Hardcore is not the right word, but that that we should poo-poo any attempts to adapt Fifth Ed, that it's not designed for that. But there's the counter-argument that the act of trying to mould Fifth Ed into a different genre or try different things does sort of force a a, a necessary element of design into the, the process of writing up your Fifth Ed clone. And that's not unvirtuous. That is, like, if you figure out a way to move Fifth Ed into a different cognitive space, you know, you're not wasting your time. You're developing design skills into and how to alter things. And yeah, there's a lot of, despite our recent episode on how to switch out of Fifth Ed, you know, there are a lot of groups who just want to play Fifth Ed. So uh, giving them tools to move around is uh you know move around their experience to try different things that that's useful and might help make them think about how other things that they could change like the entire system <laughs> yeah <laughs> another example that comes to mind is uh brand colonia it's uh, a recent enough uh, fifth fifth dead setting uh released by an italian company Asheron, and uh, it's very much based on kind of Italian literature and you know com- comedies. There's a lot of very kind of light-hearted elements. Yeah, w- wonderful artwork. Oh God, yeah. Is there a sort of a Don Quixote vibe? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. It is comedic and a lot of pathos. But uh, what what is this uh, offering up as loot? Okay, well you've got uh, proper rules for bar brawls, like non-lethal, uh, good, clean fun. Where nobody gets killed, <laughs> you know, people, you know, characters or NPCs can get roughed up. But the kingdom, as it's called, has some very well adhered to rules about, you know, if you lose a, a bar brawl, the victor can only take off what, you know, the damages of of the bar brawl and one kind of memento, you know, like you know, so you can't just you know lose you entirely. And you know, so so it, I suppose that leads to incentives like players can indulge in bar brawls without fear that their characters are going to lose, you know, everything and be out in their, you know, in their birthday suit. <laughs> what better use for uh, all that tavern terrain you misguidedly mm-hmm. made uh, during during the last couple of years? Why do people make tavern terrain? Nothing ever happens in taverns. <laughs> <laughs> Except now you can have bar brawls. It's amazing. That's got it's got it's got a bunch of other stuff, but what? Well, uh, sure, I'll let, yeah, Shade, you, you can take over. <laughs> no, I just I just like the idea of that. That sort of brings into an idea of signaling. Like, if you you pick up your dice and roll initiative, the, there's the um, cliche of you know the players immediately start fireballing these poor peasants because mm-hmm. it, it's a fight. We have to win. Good ways to signal that this is a non-lethal battle. That death is not on the line. 
Like if your hit points go to zero, it just means that you have a, a bloody nose next day. That kind of signaling, I think, is important. And that's an awful lot of what mechanics do. People might say, well, why do you need this mechanic? Well, it's to, it's to signal to the player that they're in a certain mode of play and to you know maybe drop their worries about uh, other modes of play, like, you know, fights to the death. Yeah, it's. I, I think it's got to be couched in uh, in that sort of as uh, Dave mentions, a sort of comedic aspect to it. Like the difference between real world bar brawls and the ones you see on on the TV are that real world ones involve a lot of head injuries and trips to the district court, and the ones on TV involve lots of very funny things being done with all the props that are nearby, and as you, and no one's ever really out; they're just out for the count. So uh, make sure your players understand that the first stool being chucked to their head is just an invitation to dance. Nice way mm, of putting mm, it. Exactly. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, Russ <laughs> uh, not a lot of dance halls left, but plenty of bars. Yeah, I, I'm struggling to think of, oh, do you know what? Sometimes you can go the reverse here. We, I think it's quite clear now we've talked an awful lot about what you should steal and put into something like Fifth Ed. Fifth Ed offers its own little gems for, uh, for plucking. And the takeaway, the, the big one has got to be advantage. Yeah. As yeah. introduced in, in 5e. Like, advantage, if you have a single attack dice system, then introducing advantage is a, a nice way of, of rewarding players for whatever amounts to clever play in that system, be it positioning or uh, applying aspects to a scene or, uh, or whatever else. Uh, yeah, so advantage just here. Here you get to roll your attack twice and pick the best one is something you can bring in. You don't necessarily need to take disadvantage with us, although it's an, they are a bit of a they're like salt and pepper shakers, a bit of a twin set for seasoning your system. And it's open to the GM to use as well. So if the, if the same parameters are met uh, by the NPCs, then they get advantage and disadvantage, depending on how in the weeds you want to go. But I, I certainly think. While there are people who will tell you all the reasons it's mechanically not great, eh, as a way of really engaging players in the the minute-to-minute combat, that struggle for advantage, that jockeying for position, that attempt to get you know a, a critical hit in, uh, advantage has a great way of of putting that on the table in a in a very easy to understand form. I get to roll twice. The power. It's it's just sort of amazing how D and D went like 30 years without realizing this very in hindsight very obvious mechanic and it's just it's just amazing to see this very simple idea of roll two dice take the best has just sort of blown up and just really brought the idea of simple combat advantages and disadvantages into mainstream RPG thought it it's 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 just kind of weird to say this is the simplest thing but we just didn't think of it for years yeah, we're not a smart species. Look how long it took us to get the wheel. <laughs> These things take time. I mean, that's the thing. If you consider how much of this was on the table, look how long it took us to get role-playing. Yeah. 1970s, <laughs> man. Come on. Uh, we're, we're basically in the Stone Age of role-playing. Imagine where it's going to go <laughs> and what, what we'll get to steal from it. Uh, any, any more from anyone? I guess one want to uh, make a mention, because we've been sort of dancing around OSR stuff for a while. I have I plans to run old school games at some point, but if I want to say there's one mechanic that I've stolen for everything, it's actually this weird thing of just what's called the NPC reaction tape. This this idea that when you meet someone, maybe it's an orc in a corridor, maybe it's a king on his throne, just roll 2d6. There's a very simple chart from basic D&D that you can uh, find anywhere, and it just puts things out. Are they hostile? Are they unfriendly? Are they friendly? Are they w- are they already basically your allies, or do they ne- are they neutral? Do they need you to sweeten the deal? <laughs> and just setting that up as as your initial thing, rather than just deciding, I find it a very useful tool to just consult the bones and say, what's the setup here? Like, are we starting off the wrong foot, uh, or do they already have an advantage? One of the reasons that uh, people have thrown such reaction tables and NPC moods out out of the way is they see this big section in the middle at the top of the bell curve called neutral, and they think, well, that's no good. That's not interesting. But neutrality doesn't mean unengaged with the topic. Like, 
if you, if you meet a, a, a orc uh, in the middle of a dungeon and he's surprised to see you, like, and you're all neutral, that doesn't mean he doesn't care about what's going on. He still sees these five yobos with swords and, and magic wands. But he still considers the this a very important situation he needs to pay attention to. It's just that he's not swinging back and forth whether he should pull his, out, pull out his axe or ask these people to kill the goblins that have been bugging him for the last uh, few months. He, he He's waiting. He wants you to do, please engage with me. Please show whether you're here to stab me or not. And that's just, it's just sort of a mentality thing of, you know, it's, it's, it's a 2D6 system. Maybe if you have certain uh, stats that can be adjusted up or down. Maybe if all orcs automatically hate elves, you have a minus two for having elves in your party, whatever. Where can we steal it from? It's uh, it's in basic D&D. It's been stolen by most of the OSR clones of basic D&D. I find it's obviously put RPG reaction table in. You get examples uh, on Google image search very quickly. I don't just use it for NPCs though. I find myself using it for off-screen NPC action. Stuff where the players don't really have an investment, but it's still important to figure out how things went. Uh, so I'll just like say, did the did this uh, group of... This is army going in to fight this monster. Did they well, do well? Oh no, that's a three. They're, they're all dead now. And I just find it useful to just say, well, I need to make a quick decision on what happened in this narrative. Let's just roll some bones. And just basically use the NPC reaction table as a, did this go well or not? And I find it just a very handy touchstone to have on my, uh, you know, right in front of me, just ready to go. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. I think we have stolen the show. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you have any uh, mechanics that you think are particularly liftable or pawnable. I have an entire list here that I didn't get around to. Another another massive list. You should start posting these, so uh, we can call it supplemental matter. All things, all sorts of things happen in the background of the show, folks. You can find a lot of it on the Discord. Did I mention the Discord? Uh, I'm not sure you mentioned it. <laughs> Possibly more important, um, share this episode with a friend. Steal it and share the, <laughs> share this episode with a friend. We'd love to grow the listenership uh, as always get these ideas and Scar's lists out to a wider audience. So this this is me, Savage, now asking you, listener, mention it to somebody. Put a put a tweet out. Post on Facebook. Something like that. As for tweets on Facebook, you find us, uh, you find all those details in the credits. We have been, today, we've been the adventure party. It's me, Savage Mick, Warlord Scar, and our special guest, hot off the hottest of takes on our Discord, uh, what's, what are we calling him again? Decimus Existent? That guy over there. Guy over there, not Decky. That's my uncle. Hi, hi Decky, my uncle. Never heard this. Uh, but Dave, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, cheers for having me. Hope to have you back soon. Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah. Scar? Yes? This party's? Oh, it's over. Thanks for listening to The Adventuring Party. You can find show notes and links to things we've mentioned at www.theadventuringparty.net and on our Facebook page. You can leave comments there or talk to our Twitter account at AdventurePTY or you can record a voice message at www.speakpipe.com slash theadventuringparty. We can also be contacted directly by email at party at theadventuringparty.net. If you'd like to be in touch with the party all the time, come join our Discord server. Link in the show notes. The Adventuring Party is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike Version 3 License.